Welcome back to Inside Personal Growth. This is Greg Voice and the host of Inside Personal Growth. And we have Jeffrey Shaw joining us. And Jeffrey, you got a 305 area code. So are you in Denver or Colorado or someplace? Or 305 is Miami. We are. Miami. We, yeah. well, there you go. We market the 305. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, I didn't know. I thought 305 was uh, That's was 303 Colorado. is Denver. Yeah. Okay. 303, I missed You're it close. by yeah. three numbers. <laughs> <laughs> two numbers. I'm sorry. Yeah. Two numbers. But it's a pleasure having you on the show. Um, I reached out to you because I saw you on LinkedIn. LinkedIn. You do a very popular podcast show. Um, I'm going to let my listeners know a tad bit about you before we start talking about uh, The Self-Employed Life, which is one of your books. The other book is called Lingo. Um, we're also going to put links in the blog to that for everybody so that they can uh, actually see it and experience it and go check it out at Amazon. And your website, which for my listeners is just jeffreyshaw.com. Pretty easy. Uh, just make sure you type it in all the way. Otherwise, like me, you'll actually see there was an obituary that topped up and it's not Jeffrey. <laughs> oh gosh, no, it it's not. I'm alive no, and well. <laughs> I know. So from humble beginnings, Jeffrey became one of the most preeminent uh, portrait, portrait photographers in the United States. Uh, his on-location style and fine craftsmanship made him the go-to photographer for families of C-suite executives of Anheuser-Busch, uh, Twitter, and many others. Uh, supermodels Stephanie Seymour, news anchors Jim Nance, uh, David Bloom, sports icon Tom Seaver, uh, Pat O'Reilly, or Pat Riley, I should say, Wall Street executives to, many, to mention. His portraits appear in the Oprah uh, show, CBS News. Uh, in People uh, and in O Magazine and hung at Harvard University. And I love this one because I used to listen to Norman Vincent Peale on tape when I rode in my car for years and years and years. The famous Norman Vincent Peale. For those of you who don't know, I'm connected with the foundation, but I'm also connected um, uh, with many foundations. But what a great play, what a great man. After 35 years of exceptional service of exclusive clientele, Jeffrey dedicated to share his knowledge of business branding and marketing to support self-employed and small business owners, as well as progressive minded companies. Uh, he's an in-demand keynote speaker at conferences such as How Design, a Grow Marketing corporations like Verizon and BMW and institutions such as Florida Atlantic University and Adams Center for Entrepreneurship. Uh, Jeffrey is also the author of two books, as we said, Lingo, and the one we're going to speak about today called The Self-Employed Life. Uh, and he's a LinkedIn learning instructor and regular contributor. Um, he also started his own podcast, which is now called The Self-Employed Life, which is at the top 15% of all podcasts. Congratulations, Jeffrey. That's quite a feat. I can't even say I made that after almost 15 years, but kudos to you. Uh, his TEDx link in Square Talk was later moved to TED.com, where it's rare. It's been seen, uh, and you have a chance of basically going there and taking a look at the TEDx talk. It's awesome. Um, I remember a guy speaking once, Jeffrey, and I never forget this because it was at a million dollar round table event and his name was DeWitt and he was with a National Geographic. And he said he used to listen to the small voice inside that would tell him to turn around or take a different angle or do whatever. And I so admired his approach in photography because he was basically using his intuition and I wrote a book on intuition about, you know, Listen to the voice inside. It, it'll give you the, mm -hmm. that angle of the bear or, you know, the angle of the mountain or whatever it was. Just fascinating. And as a photographer, I'm sure uh, you could attest a lot of that too, right? Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's interesting because, you know, I photograph entirely people. But I was right. capturing moments. I was capturing moments of, you know, I would say, and I had a pretty pose style, uh, but I would capture the moments in between the pose and as real life was happening. And the interesting thing that's always fascinating to me is I actually think photographers have some of the best intuitions on the planet, right? Because there's, you know, the camera is released at a fraction of a second. Your brain can't process the decision to pull that shutter at that moment. It's completely a body feeling. That's how I know it's intuition because I would know when to fire that shutter 
because my body said so. My brain right. didn't say so. My body knew that that was a moment that had to be captured. What's always fascinated me is that so people, so many people who are you know have such incredible intuition don't trust the same intuitions when it comes to making business decisions or to create the business in the life that they want. They fall victim to following rote models of business right. um, without changing the world and doing things their own way. Yeah, very important point you make. Uh, my book is called Hacking the Gap, A Journey from Intuition to Innovation and Beyond. And I so believe that, you know, because as entrepreneurs, and that's what we're going to talk about here, the self-employed person, um, you have to be willing to see around corners. You have to be willing to take risks. You have to be willing to do certain things. And that intuition is such a valuable role if you're listening and you're discerning that it's not the ego. Uh, because the reality is, I call it the soul's voice that's coming up from within inside. That's the spiritual side of me speaking. But, you know, you dedicated this book to your mother, Marge Shaw, uh, who you mentioned to be the most natural marketer and self-employed business owner there ever was. Uh, you talked about how she effortlessly built uh, forever relationships with her customers and maintained friendships uh, with her high school girlfriends for over 60 years. Your mom sounds like mine. I had a little Jewish mother. Everybody knew her. Everybody loved her. And she had, she was, talk about a marketer. She was crazy. How'd your mom influence you in actually this whole self-employed life thing? Because I think, you know, when you look at certain people in your life, um, Mothers are really important. Dads are very important. Sometimes there's people outside, but obviously your mom was real important to you. Yeah. And like I said, she was, she was such a natural marketer because she wasn't trying to market. Right. You know, I mean, and nowadays we have so many gurus that are telling us how to market. It, it's lost. It so often could lose its authenticity where she was just naturally a relationship builder. All right. Uh, I, I share uh, in the book otherwise where uh, elsewhere where my family would, I grew up very lower middle class and um, my family would camp with a tent and that, that's what my parents could afford. I didn't stay in, right. into a, into a, I didn't stay in a hotel until I was well into my own adulthood. And you weren't at the Westin. No, no. <laughs> and, um, but as we traveled, if my mom saw something that reminded her of a customer, she would buy it, right? It was just this natural thing for her to think of the people she served. She owned a beauty salon. I don't think we clarify that. So my mom owned a hair salon, which I was, I describe it as the scene straight out of steel magnolias, like yeah. a bunch of old lady, <laughs> blue hair, the old dryers that hung over their head. Like oh my this. gosh. Yeah. I always say, yeah, my mom is now 80. She just, we just celebrated her 84th birthday. Uh, this past weekend, I flew up to New York to celebrate her birthday with her. And, you know, I said, I'm I think the only reason she's 84, and I'm, I didn't expect she'd live this long. I'm glad she did. But I said, I think her lungs are just permanently expanded due to all the hairspray that she sprayed. <laughs> <laughs> I, think her, I think her organs are just petrified and lacquered. Um, but oh, that's yeah, that's, that's what that's I gained funny. from my mother was just this naturalness about relationship building, this naturalness. Yeah. And, and truly, she had... She had the same customers for decades and decades, like people that remember when I was born. And so there was this way in which she naturally created loyalty like I had never seen before. And I just can't imagine, you know, when you have a relationship with a business owner, you're so much less likely to break that relationship and try somebody else. They were just well, you know, and, and you speak about it. It's generational. You know, when you look at various generations, you look at your mom's generation. My mom died six years ago at 93. Um, you know, the reality was is that it, there was such a richness and transparency and a, what seemed to be an openness uh, of many of the people of that generation. And I'm not saying that, you know, the baby boomers don't have it, but we got in the go-go lane. You know, and people, you know, they expected certain things and they started, there was, I don't want to say a sense of entitlement, but to some degree, it started to seem like that and today even more so. And um, it, it's, I'm not negative on it. I'm just, it's just a fact. Yeah. I just don't you know, think it has to be it. that way. I mean, that, you no, know, so yeah. here's, I hear where you're coming from. I just, I'm always going to push the envelope and say it doesn't have to be that way. I mean, mankind, human, human, you know, humans don't have to change in that way. And so, for example, at the beginning of the pandemic, when uh, the pandemic hit, I recognized that I had more in reserves 
energetically than probably a lot of people would. And mm -hmm. I know that because I knew times in my life as an entrepreneur where when I stretched myself too thin um, and something comes along that's unexpected and you realize you just don't have the mental reserves or the physical reserves. Uh, and so I know that experience. Uh, to, to sum it up real quick, in the first year of my business at 20 years old, my first year of business, um, I got engaged and was going to be, was, was to be married eight months later. And my father died on my wedding day. So I firsthand had that experience of first year in business where I worked my tail off 24 seven and was planning a wedding. And when my father died, the biggest, you know, aside from the loss, I physically, I was gone. I was shut. My body shut down. Like there was nothing left in reserves. So when the pandemic hit, I knew that I had more in reserves than a lot of people would find themselves. So I made a rule to myself that anytime somebody popped into my mind that I had hopefully had their either Facebook connection or their, their phone number to text them, anybody that popped into my mind, I would fire them off a message. Assuming like we talked about intuition, there must be a reason. Why did that person pop into my mind at that moment? And I would just fire off a message and say, hey, you just came to mind. How are you doing? Right. And I, I did, did the same thing. I right? do the same thing. So yeah. that's what I'm saying. So we can be that. It doesn't have to be generational. It doesn't have to be that, you know, back in the day, people treated that way, the people that way. We can treat people that way today. And it matters. And that includes, when I say fired, that includes clients. That includes you know, I reached out to one of my clients the other day because I had a random marketing idea for her. Like she's a new client. We haven't even started our working together and I already had an idea. So I fired her off a text. I'm like, well, here's a marketing idea. And it happened to align with a request she just got, right? So it kind right. of validated. I, you know, I'm an energetic believer. Like I believe in there. So she just got this proposal. I happened to text and that my text validated this new opportunity she had. So she knew in that moment, it was the right opportunity to take. So we can be that. And I oh, think that's I what it comes down to I, be a natural I th marketer. I think you're there. And it, when there's an alignment between, you know, the people trusting you, pr trusting your company, your brand, and then the product, you know, it's it becomes pretty effortless. Mm -hmm. You know, the reality is, is that you can flow between those. And it's not like you're closing a sale. There's never a close to a sale. I, I look at people that are always talking about closing. It closes naturally because it, look, every, I say to this, uh, every time someone walks into an Apple store, you're probably already a nine or a 10 before you walk in, before you go buy whatever you're going to buy. You yeah. know the product, you know that it's high quality and you're willing to pay more money than you would normally pay for something just like it anywhere else. So, you know, after 35 years of this exceptional service to your exclusive clientele as a photographer, um, I, what I want to know is what moved you to share your knowledge of business and branding and marketing to sp support self-employed small business owners, as well as progressive minded companies. I mean, it's quite a shift for you. You go from somebody mm -hmm. who's out taking portrait photographers of very high end people probably did very well for yourself. And why in the hell do you want to do this? Yeah, well, sometimes I've wondered, I've asked myself the same question. What the hell was I thinking? Because um, it was pretty cushy, I have to say. I mean, it was, uh, it was a, you know, not that I didn't work hard, but uh, it, it certainly provided very well. And I photograph entirely in location. So, right. you know, locations to me were some of the most beautiful places in the world and mansions and everything else. So it was, it was, it was, not, it was not a hardship. What inspired the change, um, you know, the way I like to describe it now in hindsight, so it's been 37 years that I've been in business, um, 25 of which was photography full-time. And over the past 12 years, I've been doing less and less photography down to the point now where I do very, very little photography. So over the past 12 years, I've kind of been transitioning out of that and transitioning into coaching, speaking, writing books. And the way I like to describe the reason I made the changes, I felt complete. And at the end of the day, I wasn't bored. I wasn't tired of it. It wasn't time for a change. I felt complete because I fundamentally believe perfectly aligned with the theme of your show that often we become self-employed because it becomes our path for personal development and personal growth. I, you know, I don't know how many of us are conscious of it at the time. I think on some level, there's a consciousness that we're not aware, of, but I think we often choose to become self-employed to 
find in ourselves bolder versions than we currently see in ourselves. And it's an opportunity to be a bigger, bolder version of ourselves. And that was certainly my path. So when, no matter what the time frame is, when you no longer have that dangling carrot, if you will, because we often think in business, the dangling carrot is money, dangling carrot is success. The dangling carrot that sticks, because you know, success is fleeting, money is fleeting. The dangling carrot that really sticks is our desire to keep growing because that mm -hmm. never goes away. Mm -hmm. So when I felt that I just wasn't, I just didn't know how I could grow any further. I had accomplished way more than I set out to. So I looked to what could can I, I grow Can into? I add something? It's to grow, but it's also to do something positive with the growth that you have. You know, I'm sitting here 67 years old today. I could have quit this. Today? Yeah. Happy birthday. No, no, not today. Oh, I mean, okay. I, I just turned, today. No, <laughs> like, I just turned cool. 67. But my <laughs> okay. point is, I yeah. don't have to do the show. I don't mm -hmm. have to really get up and go to work. But I enjoy the conversations and then helping the world learn from people like yourself. And, you know, I did a show not that long ago, like two or three shows ago, about ADHD. I've always been ADD, ADHD. I'm like all over the place. But the reality is, is the guy pinged me. He said, you know what, Craig? The reason you wake up and do that show is because you have a purpose. And people like you have to have that. And that's what drives you. You're extremely curious. You're always looking for the next. You're looking to solve the problem. And you're looking to help people. Yeah. And I would say that's you too. I mean, I'm looking at you going, now that's got to be yeah. <laughs> pretty much the same. I'm not saying you're ADHD. What I'm saying is that is that is the mold because, you know, once you get all of this uh, personal growth knowledge, the same message, kind of you hear it over and over. And I've done almost 900 interviews. So after you hear it a lot, right, Jeffrey, mm -hmm. you say, okay, now how many people need to hear this? And we do need to hear it repeatedly to make transformation in our life. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in your introduction, I like what you said. What motivates us most is the desire to become bolder versions of ourselves. That's what you just said. Um, Basing on where you are now, your achievements as a speaker and an author, can you share with the listeners how you became a better version of yourself? Uh, oh, gosh. I can look at the question of how in a couple of different ways. So, you know, my TEDx talk, which is called The Validation Paradox, and I introduce it as a, as a paradox because often we're led to believe in the world that we need to validate ourselves. So we need to like, our, our, our personal growth seems inward. And while that is true, the how to the question you asked, how I really grew is I started listening to what other people saw in me that I didn't see in myself. Mm. And then I started observing how I would, I, I love award shows, <laughs> you know, Oscars, Tonys, all of them. And in particular, the Tonys award, one, one year I was watching it and I just acknowledged how many of the winners would acknowledge mentors and peers and other people. And they would literally say, thank you to so-and-so for seeing more in me than I saw in myself. And I realized that it seems to be the only way that we can become bolder versions of ourselves because we inherently in our own minds have whatever, no matter what our expectations are, expectation by definition is a predetermined outcome. So no matter what we expect of ourselves, even if we expect big things of ourselves, we've already pre-established the outcome. So how do you get beyond that? We get right. beyond it by, by leaning into what other people see in us that we don't see in ourselves yet. And I think I see this all the time in the world. So the how of how I grew, part of it was just, it's that certainly relates to being a photographer because these families, these affluent families saw more in me than I saw in myself. They didn't see the lower middle-class kid that grew up in a country town um, who literally had holes in his shoes in the beginning of my career. What they saw was something I didn't see in myself yet. The, the they saw the talent. They, the, the spark was there, but it lit on fire because they saw more in me and I leaned into it and I stepped and, into it. And many of those people who you worked with, they weren't some of them were given a golden spoon in their mouth yes but many of them worked for it as well most worked for it for and, and sure. they and they understood the value of that right yeah. and so they knew that whatever inspiration they could give you um 
not motivation. I'm saying inspiration uh, because I distinguish those two words quite a bit. Um, you know, and I think the most important thing for anybody out there as a small business person today, as a leader of a company, I work for companies, I still consult them. I do some of the similar stuff you do. You know, is uh, you got to have empathy and you have to be transparent and you have to have humility as a leader. Uh, I don't care if it's a 100-person company or 10,000-person company. You know, in part one, you presented the three elements of what you call the self-employed e ecosystem as personal development, then business strategies, and then the daily habits. Couldn't agree more. Mm -hmm. Can you discuss the three element elements with our audience? Yeah. And why do you refer to these as the formula for success? Because, you know... Hey, I'm looking at Stephen Kotler. He's got a great formula. He says, uh, focus is free, curiosity. After curiosity, you, you come and find your passion. You string the three passions together. You develop your purpose. After your purpose, you develop your goals. And after you develop your goals and your proximal goals, you now get grit and determination. So if you really want to look at the key formula, that's his formula. I'd love to hear your formula because this is, yeah. this is the same. This is... Got some similarities in the formula. Yeah. I think the difference is, and I'm somewhat familiar with that formula, and I'm not going to challenge, I, mean, I think the world needs different formulas because we're different yeah. people. We're different. Right. We're different. Uh, we function differently. Um, that formula is, is more linear. And my audience is self-employed people. And you mentioned ADHD. Uh, not many, most self-employed people are probably ADHD to some degree, right? Yeah. It's So my formula is ecosystem is presented as a Venn diagram. So you've got three circles. Uh, I, I'm very clear on saying, look, the only way I can write this book is that I will deliver the information somewhat linearly. So I laid out in the, each of those three systems in this order. It's personal development. I'll tell you why in a moment, but personal development, then business strategies, then daily habits. Uh, the fact of the matter is, these are all three things going on at the same time because that is the self-employed life. Oh, totally. it's li our lives are not linear. These are all three things. And in fact, um, I am just launching uh, the Self-Employed Business Institute, which is a five-month uh, coaching and training program. And what's unique about that is, yes, we do start with personal development, but we also bring the daily habits that are in their book are presented at the end. We bring those up front. Reason is, is because it can be done in any order. And I want to bring, I want to introduce the daily habits early on so that I have five, I can offer five months of accountability to make sure the daily habits are ingrained. So well, look, there's a lot of books on habits, you know, James Clear, Atomic yeah. Habit, and then there's the, uh, he's been on the show five or six times, the Tiny Habits, yeah. uh, BF Fog. And the, the psychology behind those habits is really important. I, I wondered if you would want to address just a little bit, because there's yeah. got to be a lot that has to change up here for those habits to become ingrained. Yeah. So the reason, and, and, and the subtitle of the book uh, is uh, Business and Personal Development Strategies uh, That Create Sustainable Success. The habits are the sustainable piece, right? So the reason, I'm going to back up a little bit. The reason I introduced this, this formula, this ecosystem, is that one, I wanted to compare it to an ecosystem in nature, because I feel like for the most part in business, we're taught things in silo. Right. Well, we get one book on business strategies. If we choose to, we seek out another book for personal development. Maybe we read Atomic Habits. We learn about habits. So the world is presented to us in silos because most people can't handle. I won't say most. Many people can't handle the the, the life overlapping like we self-employed people can. Most people need it more siloed. So that's the way the world is presented to us. The problem is that's not our, that's not our reality when you're self-employed. It's all happening at the same time. I refer to it as an ecosystem because if you start looking at it as an ecosystem and how those interplay, you realize like an ecosystem in nature, if one thing is off, the whole thing can be off. Okay. So that's why I introduced as an ecosystem. The daily habits is the sustainability piece. It's, it's practical and effective daily habits that can be done in an efficient measure of time, because we don't have a whole lot of time, that create a mindset that is more stable, because that's the only way you can sustain it. So I look for daily habits that create a sustainable mindset. It's interesting. I was listening to Jordan Peterson and a guy that does a podcast on psychology, and they were talking about exactly this. You know, it's like they, they said, you know, we measure IQs of people. 
and and that IQ is not a really good determining factor of whether somebody can actually manage all of those things, mm-hmm. right? Like what you were just talking about. And it an entrepreneur or somebody with that mindset learns how to, I'm going to just say, put the dots together. Mm-hmm. Um, they learn how to look for the dots and pull them together and string them together. And they really do have unique minds because there's a lot of people that are not cut out to be on entrepreneurs, thank goodness, because otherwise we'd have a whole world full of entrepreneurs. And you talk um, how so often people claim that that uh, their biggest obstacle and mention that many people have become frustrated by the hype and promise of overt motivation that doesn't actually lead to tangible change. Um, how do you get people to shift this mindset? Yeah, I think... Um... Yeah, I love that you referred before to making the distinction between motivation and inspiration because I think they're very different things and I they, they need to be distinguishedly different. Uh, so what I, I, I teach in the book is this idea that, again, motivation is not necessarily sustainable. We don't always get up. So we don't always get up every day and feel you know highly motivated. I also, when people reach out to me for coaching, they're looking for change. And because they're looking to change, you know, something pretty dramatically, better, more success in their business, what have you, I believe that the first thing you have to get clear on is what they want to get away from. It's not the normal way people look about motivation. Motivation, again, to me, is a bit of a dangling carrot. And a lot of coaches focus on that. Like, what do you want to go to? What, if we sat down a year from now and had lunch, what do you want your life to look like? It's such a typical question. The problem is that question is too premature. The first question needs to be, what is it that you want to get away from? What is it that you're so sick and tired of? What is it that you do not want to return to? Let's get clear on that so that you have the real sustainable motivation to get away from it, right? So finances are always something people want to change, right? It's not until you are flat out sick and tired of not having enough money or you're sick and tired of stressing over it. It's not until you own how sick and tired of it you are that you're actually going to do anything about it. So yeah, I want to get I, people, right? I want to get, I look at it as like the jumping point. Like you have to get people to the point of what they absolutely want to get away from before you lay, lay out the path forward. And I think part of that, I, I remember an interview with Elizabeth Gould on feeling forwards. Tony Robbins um, endorsed the book. You know, she said, look, if you can take the emotion today and move, forecast it forward and then work backward, right? So in other words, it's like, hey, if you're going to be that successful individual, what does that feel like to you? Mm-hmm. Uh, what is that into the future and project that into the future? And I think that's a really good technique that can be used by my listeners, your listeners, anybody, um, because it makes so much sense because that's where we are. You know, and in part two, you encourage people to spread the word with podcasts, like what we're ta- talking about yeah. on here. Talk about podcasting as one of the fastest growing media channels there is. Well, you know, look, I've been at this almost 15 years. It's growing fast. I don't say I've been left behind, but at the same time, I haven't grown at a rate I would like to, which offers tremendous opportunity. As a podcast host yourself, what advice can you give to encourage our audience to use podcasts in marketing their business? Yeah. You know, and again, back to the the self-employed institute that I'm, I'm just starting. We're doing our first cohort starts in September. Uh, it's a unique curriculum because, of course, it's heavy on coaching, heavy on training. But at the end, we actually do three, you could say, master classes on specific things. One of them is how to be an awesome podcast guest. It seems, you know, my copywriter, when I was working on the landing page, she worded it beautifully because it almost seems peculiar, right? That you'd have something so specific. The reason I included that is that because in the real world, for self employed business owners, being a guest on podcasts is a great way to promote your business. <laughs> so why not learn how to be good at it? I, you know, and as a host for seven years now and over 700 episodes, so many guests don't do themselves any favors, right? They don't come on with uh, any taste of value. One could call it a lead magnet. But again, I want to reframe that, not just a lead magnet, not your hook, but what taste of value can you give people that live, let them experience what it could be to work with you. I can't believe how many people don't come on with that, right? So they have no, they don't offer any taste of value to even begin building a relationship. It shouldn't feel like a hook and it has to have genuine value. Um, 
you know, people well, it's are like you, I that. told you before we even went on here, you listed your values on your website, you know, Correct. and that's pretty unusual. I mean, yeah. I do not see that. Uh, and I just wanted to acknowledge you for that. So, yeah. yeah. And, and when there's an alignment of values and an alignment of purpose, right, it's, it's so much easier to market to somebody's in alignment with you than you trying to shift them to be in alignment with it. Um, it it's sometimes it's impossible to do the other. Yeah. So you might as well find the people you like working with and get rid of the ones that you don't want to work with. Yeah. And they don't even have to agree with you. I mean, I put my values out there and I, I don't have a rule that I don't work with uh, individuals or organizations if they don't match my values. But I do believe that if you don't have to agree with them, but you might find them compelling or you might yeah. simply find the, the idea that I'm so forward with them compelling. And that is, enough. like I said, I'm not looking to create a world where everybody in my world, I go through this battle on social media all the time that, you know, <laughs> Believe me, social media would be a, a nicer place for a lot of us if everybody in our world on social media agreed with everything we said. So if we posted something political, everybody agreed with it. But what's to be gained in that? So right. I don't unfriend people randomly because they don't agree with my point of view. Right. Right. Because that's not realistic to the world. There are going to be people that disagree with your, your, your view. But I do think there can be respect. Even if you don't agree, I think there can be respect for the fact that it could be compelling that somebody stands up. So I don't expect that it's going to invite only people who agree with my view, but it's going I go, to invite agreed. The type, right? The, yeah, I saw somebody, somebody who's compelled. I saw somebody put three concentric circles on, uh, I think it was LinkedIn with a me in the middle. And it said, there's people that don't want to wear a mask. There's people that will wear a mask, right? And then there's those who will accept whether or not you're wearing a mask or not. And I think the reality is if you're at the conjunction of that, it's like, hey, are we in acceptance of, there's going to be a difference of opinion. You know, somebody comes in, they're wearing a mask. You don't slam somebody for wearing the mask. Um, okay, they're wearing a mask. Uh, you're not wearing a mask. They shouldn't slam you for that. So th this pandemic has really brought out a lot of that kind of thinking, right, about uh, how we're teaching people. And in part three, you talk about new model of success. Um, I think if you'd elaborate for the listeners on the new model to kind of enlighten them what the new model of success is and what's, what's part of that new model of success. Yeah. Uh, this is actually one of the more fun uh, concepts for me to bring into the book because I believe in it so much, which is you know, let's look at the old model, right? The old, and, and I know this because it's been a 37 year journey for me. And to me, what I, what, what gives me pleasure about this concept is that it acknowledges evolution. It acknowledges that people have changed. And I, th I think we change as a society. First of all, I think as a society, we change rapidly. Um, you know, anytime there's a crisis, people's values shift. So the world actually changed. And I think, hu I think humankind has evolved quicker than we give ourselves credit for. So, the old model of success when I started out in business was that it was all hard work and hustle, right? right? I mean, it was, it was even to the degree, not so much my style, but to the degree that people would step on one another, right? It was, um, actually we were, the movie we were trying to talk, I think about before is the Wolf of Wall Street, I think. Yeah, yeah, right? that's it. Okay. So it's kind of that attitude, you know, that's the old model Belfort. of success. Belfort the, is the his old name. model of success was all hard work. Competition, not cooperation. Correct. Where now the new model of success is, I refer to it as co-creation, mm -hmm. right? It's co-creating with the people that you want to serve. Um, I mean, you could use as a, a light example, software companies that put out a beta version, right? The whole, I actually did a podcast years ago on having a beta mindset. I think more entrepreneurs would benefit from having a beta mindset. Like you have an idea, you have a concept. How about co-creating with the people you want to serve? How about not assuming that you know everything about what they, they need? How about co-creating it with them to find out what they need? You know, I've been saying for years that businesses have, for decades, forever perhaps, businesses have fundamentally been, been built backwards. People build the business they want to build. They make a box. Then they run around for years marketing, trying to fit people into the box they built. Where today, the new model of success is that you build, you get to know the people you want to serve and build a box for them. Like get to really know who you want to serve, what emotional triggers they have, what their experiences are, what's the problem under the problem that they want solved. And then define who your ideal customer is 
and then build a business that they recognize that that's for them. That's yeah, the and new then, model of success. It's, it's and one it's of the elements that has prevented the evolution of the species to adapt that quicker has been our own inherent ego and fear. And so when you're operating from a model of fear and not a model of love, uh, you have a tendency to push that under and then push uh, versus right. pull or bring to you. Yeah. Um, because with that comes a lot of anger and a lot of frustration. You know, I'm not reaching my goal. I'm not doing whatever versus the attraction model, Correct. which, and I'm not going to talk about the law of attraction per se, but, you know, my days go back to Louise Hay and all the books that were written at Hay House and the laws of attraction. But the reality is, is that is the truth. And it's the energy in which you emit. We had Dr. Jim Lair on here. Uh, the power of full engagement always talks about energy. And with entrepreneurs, I'd say there's one thing. And it's a really important element. And that is how you manage your energy. You talked about it earlier and alluded to it. You know, when you were 27, it was go, 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 go. You could do it. You get to be 67 years old and you find that there is more of a limited amount of energy and you have to be smarter with where you apply that energy. If there's only one thing I tell the people to be smarter with where they apply it and more focused. Look at your wildly important goals, uh, you know, and and work on those. And you concluded the book with a negative review. Actually, and, I just want to hang on. I want to stick with ahead. the energy because this, this, I think, is such a, you bring up such an important point, particularly for entrepreneurs who are listening in. Here's the most important thing you can understand about energy is that today, and this, this represents that new model of success that I was referring to, in today's world, and I say this with, with proof because I've been in business so long, in today's world, people choose you to do business with you based on how they feel about you more than ever before, right? They're, they're, people no longer choose based on you're the best in your field because the, being the best in any field is subjective and people are not willing to sacrifice being be, being treated well, they're not willing to put their money. There are a lot of brands that I won't go to because I don't. I know enough about the company to know what they support and where their money goes, and it's against my values. So I don't go to that brand, right? So people choose. They will disregard brands and experiences. They choose who to do business with based on how they feel about that business. There is an energetic decision like we have never seen before. That's why it's so important to portray your values. And maintain your energy, the energy you're putting out, very much as the energy you will attract. So eloquently said, yes. You know, I'm working with a business owner right now that it became an instructor. Five years ago, he worked with me. It was really tough to work with. I mean, extremely. He's now gone through Landmark Forum, and he's a teacher of it. Mm -hmm. And you can't imagine the shift in the CEO from <laughs> five years ago and today, yeah. what he really, how he treats the people and so on, uh, and, and me as well. Um, you know, you concluded the book with a negative review that you could think, if you think about the book and you said, hey, you did that to face your greatest fear in writing the book. Mm -hmm. um, can you discuss with the listeners the greatest fear that you faced in writing this book while well, you had lingo before this. Mm -hmm. So yeah. obviously it's not your first. It's for me, it's like my second as well. Um, how'd you overcome that fear? Yeah. Well, you know, is this, this book was a different set of fear um, in part because it was my sophomore book and let's face it, you know, singers always suffer from the sophomore album. It always bombs. Right. So I had a little sophomoric fear uh, that uh, the first book did well. And I was afraid that there was a, now there was, I had set an expectation. So were people going to like this one as much? This book, the self-employed life was also um, it, it was tapping into something very deeply personal for me because I wrote it because I realized why am I not the advocate for self-employed business owners in the world? You know, I asked myself, like, why not me? You mm -hmm. know, it's the, all I've ever known. I actually, I've never had a traditional job. I've never, right. ha I've never received a paycheck. Like all I know is self-employment, which began from the age of 14 on. Mm -hmm. So this felt so much more aligned with my, my purpose on, on earth than, than anything I'd done before. So with that, Anytime you get closer to that, that deep purpose, the more fear shows up. For me, the biggest, my biggest fear around this book is because I was, Lingo had a blend of 
spirituality and coaching with the business practices, this book really amped the game. This book was really, I mean, I've got over a thousand, I've received over a thousand hours of training as a coach. Like I'm a legit coach, but in the business world, I always pulled that back a little bit. And I even started referring to myself as a consultant, not a coach, because I wanted to be taken more seriously in this book, the self-employed life. I let the coach loose. And I was like, I don't care what people are going to think. Although I say I didn't care, but I did care. The fear in the back of my head was that people are going to think I was too woo-woo. The fear in the back of my head is that people are going to think that this whole idea of spirituality, and I talk about brain priming in the world and how, you know, in business and how you can use the science of brain priming, like what you put in your brain is what you're more likely to recognize. So you can completely control what you see in the world by deciding what you put into your brain. Totally. Right. Um, and it's, there's a science behind brain. It's why people have that experience of you've never heard about something and then you hear about it and you see it over and over again. That's brain Same thing with the subconscious. You can program Correct. the sub. I use a hypnotist. Right. Um, I like you, I put in thousands and thousands of hours. I have a master's degree in spiritual psychology, um, which the reality is, you know, when you're doing trio work and you're a client, coach, independent, third-party observer, you know, you see that. And, and what I would always, what they would always say is uh, one thing I remember, Jeffrey, was you don't have to believe everything you think, which I thought was a great statement, number yeah. one. Two, uh, if a camera rolled all day long and followed you, would you like what you saw? Yeah. And I love that because, you know, for a self-employed person, what is the bigger purpose for what you're doing this for? Uh, other than just making money uh, and living the lifestyle you want. If you were to leave our listeners with three great takeaways, Jeffrey, from this book um, that you really think would compel one to make a transformation in their life um, in some way, what would those three be? Hmm. Uh, well, let me take the question one at a time. So one would be that, uh, that when you're self-employed, there is little to no division between your business and your personal life. And I, and I, but let me say that carefully. I don't mean it to mean that um, you're overworking because I'm not suggesting that. I, to me, there is a direct connection that your level of success is related to your level of personal development. Mm -hmm. Anytime you want your business to grow, you have to grow inwardly first. I, I refer to it as capacity. So, you have to increase, and that's one of the fundamental problems that people are always adding more strategy, but they haven't increased the capacity within themselves to not just handle the higher level of success, but to feel they deserve it. Mm -hmm. It's one of the big, right? So you have to increase what you believe you deserve in order for that next level of success to even come. So that's one is that you have to understand this. It's not just that, you know, we work 24 seven, perhaps, which I like said, I don't encourage that is that your success is directly related to who you are as a person. Right. So that's one big takeaway. Another big takeaway um, is that every self-employed person I've ever met. In fact, it's one of the first things people say to me when they reach out for coaching is they feel like they're all over the place. And I relieve them of the blame of that because we tend to think it's because we're ADHD, right? We look for all the reasons. The fact better is when you're self-employed, you have had to run all over the place to get all the bits and pieces. You hire a coach for your mindset. You take, you buy programs online to give you, to train yourself on social media. You go to conferences, you go to, you're, you're already running all over the place to get what you need. And then you're blaming yourself for being all over the place. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Right. So the structure of the business world is not set up for self-employed people. And that's actually why I have launched the self-employed business Institute because it's coaching, it's, it's business strategies, it's daily habits. It's just like my book. It brings everything together because currently, or you know, prior to launching this, that did not exist. So I like to relieve people of the blame that they, they cast on themselves for that. The third big takeaway, let's see, what would I come up with for that? Um, you know, I, I, going back to the daily habits, I think it's so often overlooked. And, you know, we mentioned, and we were talking earlier about taste of value. The taste of value I can offer your listeners is my, my assessment, uh, which they can get at selfemployedassessment.com. And this is a custom algorithm. You, you 
answer these six questions and the custom algorithm provides really good feedback on which of the three areas of the self-employed ecosystem that you need to put some work into. And daily habits is consistently one of the lowest ones. That's why people end up feeling like they're a hamster on a wheel experiencing the roller coaster up and down. It's because they're so busy with the doing that they're not introducing into their lives the practices that will create a consistent mindset. And the consistent mindset will enable you to weather the ups and downs better. So consistently across the board, as I review the assessments that come through, um, that people rate themselves, they're, they're aware that they should have better daily habits but they haven't integrated them because they, and I believe it's because they haven't really seen evidence of the value uh, that they can bring, but it's Yeah, I think it's, a, I agree with you because I wrote about this in my book, but I remember Barnett Bain. Uh, it's the doing being conundrum, mm -hmm. you know, and there's a, there's a balance between that. And I think what you're saying is, you know, look, uh, most entrepreneurs are doing beings, but are they being beings? Mm -hmm. And they, the being part becomes, what is it that you're becoming as a result of all you're doing? Yeah. Um, and if you're screwing up your relationships and you're not having fun, then, you know, the self-employed life is not for you. You might as well go take a job and do whatever. But if you're enriching the relationships and you're re feeling rewarded, uh, and you feel like you can give back, then I think you're making a difference in the world and that's what's important. Um, and you gave our listeners just a lot to think about. So I want to direct them uh, to your website again. And at the website, it's uh, just jeffreyshaw.com. Uh, but the, the website is loaded, right? There's a, a plethora of things you can do. We'll also put link to that assessment. We'll get that assessment link from Jeffrey, and we'll put it into the blog entry as well so people can go to that. And I'm sure you've made a connection with Dory Clark by now, mm -hmm. but uh, <laughs> you and her almost speak exactly the same language. Mm -hmm. I appreciate your, re uh, your approach to this, Jeffrey. Um, it's saneness, and I, and I call it, it's harmony. Mm -hmm. You know, when we, when we do the self-employed business, um, we, we can easily get out of harmony. And I think there's something called productive harmony. I, I actually created a course called Productive Harmony. You can be productive and it can be in harmony and balance with your creative side as well. So my hat is off to you. Namaste Thank you. to you. Thank, Thank you. you for uh, your blessings and the gracefulness in which you've uh, delivered this message today. Uh, and thanks for writing the book. And my listeners will, will have a link to Amazon to get that book as well. Uh, parting words? Or are you done? Uh, I, you know, thank you for having me. I appreciate the conversation. What I like about this, uh, I was excited to be on your show because it, it being about personal development, like it's so, I love the integration of being able to bring personal development into business. We need more of that. We need more self-employed people, which is a fast growing trend um, because then, you know, business for the consumer is doing business with real people. It's real relationships. And I actually think every, every business transaction with a small business can uh, be self-actualizing, right? It can be, it can make your day. It can be an opportunity to, for everybody to grow. So I don't take it lightly. So I appreciate it. Well, and, and for those of you out there sitting on the fence, you can become an entrepreneur as well. So I, I encourage you to think about the opportunities, maybe even with inside your company to be that that entrepreneur working for the entrepreneur because they are looking for entrepreneurs. <laughs> I'm actually working on a talk, uh, a quick, quick story. When I wrote the book, I told my speaking rep that let's focus on speaking at associations because companies are not going to hire me to come in and talk to their employees about becoming self-employed. But then I, once the book was out, I realized I was having a lot of conversations with corporate pe folks uh, about the idea of what I call, instead of entrepreneur, I refer to as a self-employed mindset. Yeah. I think they're your best employees, right? Right. The best employees for companies today are to hire people that have a self-employed mindset, that autonomy, that, that level of caring about your company as if it was their own. They just don't want to deal with the hassle of having their own business. That's your dream employee. In, that, the is, that is your dream employee. And I can't wait. Do you have a, a thing on the, uh, the self-employed? 
person or would they um, just use your book and your actually, course? Actually, so I'm a contributing writer for Entrepreneur Magazine. So if okay. you go to entrepreneur.com and search my name, I just, one of my articles about the self-employed mindset was just published within the last two weeks. We will um, certainly put a link to for our listeners. Jeffrey Shaw, thank you so much. Thank you for all that you're doing. Uh, we'll make sure we put links to Lingo as well and to this book for at Amazon. Thanks thank so you much. For having me. Thank you. Bye-bye now.